A blessed morning, afternoon, and evening to you all, and welcome to Feast at Home. To all our first-timers watching, we are so glad to have you all with us. As your spiritual family, we all do pray that the Lord will speak to your heart through this session. Before we begin, let me ask you all a simple question. Was there ever a moment when you doubted God and His ways? We all had such moments especially during these past few months, with everything that has happened not only here in our country, but also throughout the rest of the world. We have become vulnerable to the point where we are magnetized by fear and the biases it brings. But come to think of it, even Jesus had his moment of weakness. But despite that, he decided to trust the Father to allow his will be done. For he knows that by carrying the cross, by going through suffering, we will be freed from sin and be a testament of his love. Friends, remember this. If every earthquake, every storm, every tsunami, and every war has an end, then this crisis and our personal battles will end as well. Our Lord has a promise engraved in our hearts. And all we have to do is to embrace our cross and allow the Lord to journey with us through our hardships. As what scripture says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. With this, let's all do the sign of our faith as we come in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, you know what we're going through. You know the amount of fear buried in our hearts. But at this moment, we have decided to let it go and to place our fullest trust to you and your promise. We will embrace our cross and allow your will be done. We declare this as we sing this song with the fullest of our hearts. God, if you're willing, take it away. Suffering and pain Take them away from my hands God, if this burden And call is your plan I trust in your ways Scroll. 
fallen and still overcome He conquered the grave and the cross And I know you will never come Not now that you Father, not our will, but your will be done. With this in mind, Lord, we stand with confidence, for we know your word, your promise will prevail amidst every adversity. As we continue to sing for you, we will take a step further as we grasp onto your mighty hand and as we stand to your promise.
is gained righteousness at Christ's expense. The grace of God is not generic. There is a dimension of grace. Grace is God choosing to bless us rather than curse us as our sin deserves. From Latin, price paid. Mercy is loving the unlovable and forgiving the unforgivable. So the grace of God gives you the ability to accept, to act, to appreciate, and to adore Christ. Realizing that forgiveness is setting a prisoner free and discovering that that prisoner is me. <laughs> Hey there, welcome to Feast at Home. My name is Mike Vinas, I'm the Feast Builder, or you can think of leader or preacher for Feast Bellevue PM. Um, I'd like to welcome those of you who are tuning in for the very first time. Glad that you're here. In fact, I hope that this would be the first of many times that you would be blessed by the Feast. And in case you're wondering, the Feast is a celebration and a community of life, love, and faith. And I am grateful that I get to share this with you today. Now, speaking of today, let me ask you, are you finding it hard to get things done in this season? I mean, do you sometimes feel lazy to make any kind of progress? If your answer is yes, then I feel you, man. I feel you because that's how I was feeling this past week. I felt meh, I felt lazy. I mean, wala hong gana, I had no drive. I didn't really feel like working. In fact, every day, I just felt like singing that song of Bruno Mars, right? Because today I don't feel like doing anything, right? I just want to lay in my bed. Don't feel like picking up my phone to so leave the message on the tone. Because today I don't feel like doing anything, nothing at all. Ooh, ooh. Anyway, I... I I really didn't feel like doing anything. I felt, I, just, I felt like, as people would say today, I just felt like languishing. Until, until my son, um, for the very first time, ate solids, all right? You see, I'm a, I'm a new parent of an almost six-month-old boy named Kyler. And so you have to forgive me for, for much of my stories will be about my child. <laughs> but any parent would probably do that. But anyway, my wife, Veya, just just tried feeding, some, feeding him some carrots. And really, to our surprise, he opened his mouth and he started eating. And it happened one spoon after another. So um, in this photo, it may seem like uh, it all just went to his cheeks, but I tell you, somehow he did manage to swallow some of them, I'm sure. And really, witnessing that small milestone, my child eating solids for the very first time, witnessing that small milestone in our child's progress made us so happy as parents. And it just got me thinking, just got me thinking how God, our Heavenly Father, celebrates every small milestone of progress that we make, right? Let's say that again. God, our Heavenly Father, celebrates every small milestone of progress that we make. He rejoices to see us get up in the morning, get up in the morning from bed, even if somehow we wanted to snooze all day. He rejoices to see us come to prayer and open up our Bibles, even just for five minutes. I mean, He, he rejoices when, to see us spend time with a loved one, even if all we wanted to do was to binge on the next thing on Netflix. I mean, we can go all day with examples, but here's my point. No matter how small the step you're taking, God sees it and He celebrates it with you. No matter how small that step that you're making right now to make some sort of progress in your life, God sees it and He celebrates it with you. In fact, I love this. In, in Zechariah, in the book of Zechariah, chapter 4, verse 10, it says there, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices 
to see the work begin. You know, knowing this truth somehow got me to get up and get going. So may I encourage you, my friend, let's get things done with the one who celebrates us and our every single win with us. Yes, let's get things done for the one. Amen? Amen. And together, let's pray. And let's allow the love of the Lord to just fuel us and drive us to live out His plan and purpose for our lives as together we come in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Together we pray. Today I receive all of God's love for me. Today I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today I open myself to God's blessings, healing, and miracles. Today I open myself to God's word so that I become more like Jesus every day. Today I proclaim that I am God's beloved, I am God's servant, I am God's powerful champion, and because I am blessed, I am blessing the world in Jesus' name, amen. And together in honor of God's word, as we open up our lives to his wisdom, to his grace, together we sing. Thy word is the lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Today, we are back. We are back on this epic adventure through the Gospel of Matthew. So, why don't you grab your Bibles with me, whether it be physical or digital, whatever your fancy is, whether it lights up or not, that's fine as long as it's a Bible. Turn your Bibles with me, take it and turn it to Matthew chapter 16 verses 13 to 25. And I'm encouraging you to do this because I don't know about you, it just, it's just so much better if it's read up close. All right? So turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 25. And today I want to preach around the simple yet tough question to answer. And it's tough if we are real and honest with ourselves. All right? And the question is this, who do you follow? Who do you follow? And to illustrate the difficulty of this question, let me share with you um, this story. Once there's this woman who, who sold her soul to the devil. Imagine that, all right? And she did that literally. And I think after many years of desperation, she prayed to the devil and said, I am selling my soul to you, all right? And in, in return for that, make me rich. And it happened. Soon after that, money flowed into her life like the Niagara Falls. I mean, she met evil people and these evil people became her business partners and she traveled all across the United States um, and she bought business after business, mansion after mansion and she had so much money that she had no idea what to do with it. But one day, it hit her. She felt empty. She felt broken. She felt that her life was just all messed up and so she felt she was already in hell. She was so miserable with her life that she was so tormented that she wanted to, to kill herself. In fact, she attempted many times. But in one of her rock bottom moments, she finally turned to God. And she said, God, if you're real, would you help me? If you're real, if you're out there, would, would, you, would you help me? And in that moment, she started renouncing the devil. And pretty soon, oh, she lost all her businesses, all her mansions, and she even ended up buried in so much debt. But she became happy with her, with her newfound relationship with God, following Him in her life. Now, I share with you this story um, because I believe God is asking you God is asking you today this question. Who do you follow? And for most of us, the choice is not A, devil, or B, Jesus. Right? In fact, if that was the choice, many people would probably, it would probably be an easy choice. Right? It would obviously be, hopefully, and I assume it's B, Jesus, right? That you'd, you'd want to follow. But for most of us, the reason why it's not an easy answer or why it's not an easy choice because the choices are A, our version of Jesus, or B, Jesus, if you get what I'm saying. 
I mean, will it be A, our preconceived notion of Jesus according to our possibly self-serving expectations of Him and what He should do for us? Is that A, our version of Jesus? Or B, the real Jesus? who may or may not be according to our expectations. Now, now, don't answer that question just very quickly. Don't answer it arbitrarily. I mean, let's think about our answers well, because I believe our answer to that question, who do we follow, should come from a deep conviction. And I believe this message today will help us get to that. And this passage we're about to read is all about that. Now, let me give you a quick background before we begin reading, all right? We're now in Matthew chapter 16, and we're now at this juncture in Matthew, all right, where Jesus will spend more time with his inner circle, with his 12 disciples. And he's going to do this before his final showdown that's going to happen in Jerusalem, where it's all going to go down, okay? And if you think about it, actually, I would probably do the same. You'd probably do the same. Like, if you know that your days are numbered, you'd probably double down on the guys, on the people who will continue the mission when you're gone, right? And that's what, was Jesus, that's what Jesus was doing right here. But the thing was, is that Jesus was in a tight fix. He was in a tight situation right here. Because up until this point, in fact, even until this point, his guys still didn't get his mission completely. I mean, They thought they were on this political or military conquest to fight off the Romans and free Israel from its captors. And and that's, that's their mode. That's their thinking. In fact, we'll talk more about that later. But they were following Jesus. They were following Jesus based on that expectation. They were following, they thought that they were following this political, military general version of Jesus that they had in their heads. And if you, if you really think about it also in the context of where we are today, that's not far from what's happening today, right? Because many follow, many of us follow our own version of Jesus. I mean, just let's just, some real talk, okay? Some of you, some of us follow genie Jesus. We believe that our wish or our dream is Jesus' command. It's for him to fulfill. And when it's not fulfilled and when it doesn't happen, we throw a tantrum and we say that God is not real and we become atheists. Sounds familiar, right? Or or some of us, um, we follow convenient Jesus. We serve him, but when things go out of our way or it means for us to somehow die to ourselves, we hold back, right? Or some of us follow comfortable Jesus. We follow him as long as it's convenient for us. But as soon as following him leads to suffering, then we're out. We're out, right? And sadly, there are actually many more other versions of Jesus that we sometimes follow. So, will the real Jesus please stand up, right? Will the real Jesus please stand up? Stand up. And that's what we're going to see here happen right now. In verse 13, Matthew 16, verse 13, read with me. It says there, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And then in verse 14, they replied, Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Let me ask you, let's pause there a bit and let me ask you, who do you, or do you have a shopping app on your phone? All right. And in fact, do you, be honest with me, do you have stuff on your cart that you haven't checked out, that you haven't bought yet? Okay. In, In fact, in full honesty and transparency, let me share with you what's in my cart. Okay. I have here, um, Bluetooth earphones for underwater because I'm somehow swimming these days, because in it, summer and all of that, for exercise, I'm swimming. So I want to be able to listen to something as I swim. So I actually have several models, several brands of a Bluetooth earphone that can run underwater. And I really can pick which one of them. So it's there in my cart. I also have slippers, because I picked up slippers recently. I work from home, it's been a long time. 
I also have a waffle maker. Also different models, different brands, because I can't seem to pick which one, which one is the best. Thankfully, my wife bought it for me for my birthday last March. Um, and then I have, what is this? And I have ink cartridge for our printer. Thankfully, that's just one kind for the printer. But I find it amazing. I don't know about you, but I find it amazing how today, because of online shopping, there's so many choices to one product. And it's not really that easy to choose which is the best for us, which will suit our needs. I mean, many of us, and I, I included, would somehow have to look at product reviews, features, and specs. And that's probably why we have it all parked in our cart because we're, we haven't chosen, we haven't decided. We're awaiting for that day uh, or that sale day when we finally choose and decide to buy that product. In the meantime, it's in the cart. Now, what does this have to do with our passage that we just read? Well, this conversation where Jesus was talking to his apostles, the place where this happened, Caesarea Philippi, is very significant. I mean, Jesus could not have chosen a more dramatic theatrical backdrop to drop this question. Because this area right here, Caesarea Philippi, was like the Lazada for pagan gods. I mean, it was littered with many temples of Syrian Baal gods. Um, who, and they had a long, colorful, colorful history as well of history, or sorry, long, colorful history of Greek gods, plus a huge um, marble temple to worship the Roman emperor as their deity. So in other words, this was the place to go god shopping. This was the place where you pick your god, the, pick the god that you want, that you want to follow. And amidst this plethora of idols around them, Jesus asks them, pretty much in this discussion, who do you follow? And to paraphrase probably what he was saying is that, is this, will the real Jesus follower please stand up? <laughs> will the real Jesus follower please stand up? Because if you look at today, Right? In fact, if you look at history from that time until today, the world that we live in, the world that we live in now, somehow became just like Caesarea Philippi. It has become a place where people worship many gods. Many people, including ourselves sometimes, would worship wealth, power, success, likes, views, right? All of those stuff. But really, we must choose who or what we worship. We need to decide who or what we follow. So ask yourself, as God is asking you today, who do you follow? So Jesus, after asking, who do you say I am? And listening to his disciples share their juicy gossip of what they heard from other people, of who he is. He then asks them a more important question. And we see this in verse 15. He asks them, but who do you say I am? And I love this question. I love this question because when you follow God, it must be personal. It must be personal. It must be real for you. And one of my favorite facets or characteristics of God is His faithfulness. God is faithful. Amen? Amen. Recently, um, Bea and I have been anxious because with the coming of our son, Kyler, our expenses, expenses have really shot up. And with the pandemic, some of our income streams were hit, causing our savings to get eaten up. So things really have been financially tight for us the last months. And really, I'll tell you, it has really been a challenge to trust in God's faithfulness. Now, two weeks ago, during our wedding anniversary, we, we were lining up in this bakery that Bea wanted to try for our anniversary, and we've actually been saving up for it. So we entered the bake shop with masks, of course, and face shields, and then we lined up and we started looking over the counter on which, which pastry we would get. And all of a sudden, the woman in front of us turned to us and said, oh, you're here. Happy anniversary. Now, at first, we couldn't make out, we couldn't recognize who she was I mean, because of the mask and the face shield. But after some time, after a while, we, we actually did. Uh, apparently, 
it was one of our ninangs in our wedding, Tita Mids. And so we said, Hi, Tita, it is so good to see you. It's been a long time. We've missed you and the whole family. And she said, Well, what are you doing here? And we responded, Well, we wanted to try out the pastries in this bake shop. They say it was good and looked good on, on Instagram. And then she said, Go ahead. Pick as much as you want. It's my treat. Happy anniversary. And hearing that, we were so happy and blessed by her generosity. By her generosity. I mean, taking consideration where we were coming from, we, were been, we have been hard up and we, we were finding it difficult to really sustain our family. And then hearing that kind of generosity, even just so small, just really ministered to us. Because somehow, through what she said, we felt that it was God's message for us. It was a message from the Lord to us. That in the middle of feeling down and worried with our financial constraints, that surprise out of nowhere felt like God's assurance that He is faithful to us in our need. My friend, who is God to you personally? Who is God to you personally in this season of your life? I mean, what is your experience? What, what has been your encounter of Him lately? Is He healer for you? Is He defender, provider? Is He savior? Is He redeemer? Is he friend? I mean, who do you say he is? Because again, when you follow God, it must be personal. It must be real. It must come from a deep personal revelation and conviction. It must be true for you. Because only you can choose to follow Jesus, not anyone else, not your parents, not your friends, not your neighbors, not even your leaders. Only you can sacrifice your life for God. No one else can do that for you. And that's the decision you need to make today and every day. Yes? Now back to the story, all right? When Jesus asked this piercing question, who do you say I am? I mean, I can imagine somehow the usually chatty disciples were stumped. I mean, awkward silence hung in the air like a knife. Some of them were probably gazing at their feet all right, or glancing on, on trees just for them not to look at Jesus looking at them. Because okay? um, they probably felt that they might give the wrong answer so they weren't looking at Jesus as Jesus was saying this. But then out of nowhere, as Peter would usually do, Bibo Peter as you know him, Peter saved the day and says this in verse 16. He says this, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now the word that he used here was Mashiach. Can you say that with me? Type it on the chat or maybe you can type it on the chat, but just say it with me so that you can remember Mashiach, like that with a, with a yak, okay? Mashiach, was really an emotionally packed and historically loaded word. See, Mashiach meant anointed one, which means Christ. And it's good to know because some people actually thought that Jesus was his first name and Christ was his last name or family name. That is not true, all right? Christ means Messiah or anointed. But what does it mean to be anointed? See, to be anointed meant oil was poured over your head. And who was this done to usually? Only kings and priests were anointed that way. So here we are, here we are. Just follow along with me and think about this. So for the Jews, Jesus being the Mashiach, the anointed one, meant two things. One, that the Mashiach, Jesus, was the new Moses, a priest figure who, who would free the Jews the way God liberated them from, from Egypt. And two, that Jesus, the Mashiach, was the new King David. I mean, the greatest king um, that, that, that their, their nation has ever seen in all of their history where the, he was able to unite Israel to become a world superpower. So that was their expectations of Jesus as Messiah. And man were those out of this world expectations. But Peter and most likely the apostles saw Jesus 
this way. They saw Jesus as a priest liberator and a political king. And whether or not Peter had the right version of, or expectation of Jesus um, in his head, he planted his flag on the ground and declared, making that decision that that is you, Jesus. You are our new Moses. You are our new David. Now, that expectation of who Jesus was by them, by Peter, will later be clarified by Jesus himself. That will be refined later on. We'll talk more about that. But I just want to zero in something here. I want to zero into something. I loved what Peter did here. I mean, he said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. I love what he did. He made a decisive decision to follow Jesus born out of a personal conviction. See, when it came to Jesus, he was not dilly-dallying. He was not indecisive. He was not undecided. He decided to follow Jesus. In fact, when it comes to non-essential matters, it's okay. I mean, it's okay to sit on the fence, to dilly-dally, and to to remain undecided, right? Like, for example, if let's say um, I would to choose which one to give up forever between burgers and pizza, I would be undecided because I love both, Right? Or if let's say it's between coffee or milk tea, I wouldn't know what to choose not to have forever. Right? Maybe you would, so good for you. Or maybe let's say it's between Lazada or Shopee, on which one you will give up forever. If that's the case, maybe many of you would be undecided as well. And that's okay. That's fine. But friends, when it comes to what is essential, when it comes to what is important, when it comes to what truly matters, we must have, like Peter, the courage to plant our flag on the ground and be on the side of which we want to stand on, to really decide whose side we're standing on. So if Jesus asks you today, who do you follow? What will you answer? Where, which ground will you plant your flag on? Will it be A, your version of Jesus, or B, the real, historical, biblical Jesus. I mean, what would it be? What would it be for you? In fact, why don't you answer that on the chat? Type your answer. Would it be A or B? Right? Now let's continue. In verse 17, it says here, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did, you did not learn this from any human being. And then Jesus does something surprising in verses 18 to 20. He says there, Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. All right, quick fact on this before we move on. Quick fact on this, as Catholics, we believe that through these verses, Jesus established Peter's um, role as head of the early church. And the leaders of that early church believe that in these verses, Jesus also established the authority of the Pope as the head of the universal church. Pretty cool, right? I mean, it's good to know. It's good to know that. Now, I want to backtrack a bit um, and go back to verse 17 and point something out there. Because after Peter's declaration of who Jesus is, remember he said he is the son of the living God, he is Messiah. After Peter's declaration of who Jesus is, Jesus honors Peter for his answer, for what he said. And again, I want to highlight what Jesus replied. He said, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. And I love Jesus' reply here. You see, God is not playing hide and seek. He's not. He's not leaving esoteric clues here and there that requires people with an IQ of 180 to decipher them or to understand them. I mean, God is constantly revealing Himself in our lives, in His love for us, He he wants Himself, He wants Himself and His love to be known by us, His children. 
You know, as a father to my son, I often would wonder if Kyler knows me, if he knows that I'm his father, and if he knows that I love him so much. So I, I always try to introduce myself to him and make him feel my love as his father. And I do this by hugging him, kissing him, changing his diapers, putting him to sleep, and so much more. I'm sure those of you who are parents know what I'm talking about for all that you do for your children. And one confirmation that I get that he probably knows that who I am and my love for him is that every time I smile at him, he smiles back. And you can see that in this photo. But one day, I got an even better confirmation, confirming that some, somehow he probably knows me and knows that I love him. Because it happened this way. It happened in one afternoon. I was working in my office, um, which was next to the bedroom where Kyler was. And I heard him awaken, probably from an afternoon nap. So I stood up and I walked into the room to come to him. And when I walked in the room, something happened. And when I walked out of the room, something also happened. So to show you what took place, what happened, right? And what I'm talking about, watch this video. Basketball? Football? So, whenever I would come to him, he would laugh out loud, and you can hear it, right? Um, but when I would walk away, he would cry. And when I would go back, he would laugh. And when I would walk away, he would cry. So I guess somehow this means that Kyler, my son, is aware of my presence. He knows me, and maybe to some degree, he knows who I am and my love for him. And as much as it gives him delight to know that I'm there, it gives me more joy as his father that he knows me. My friend, the same is true for God. Maybe you feel that God is playing hard to get with you and that it's hard to find him or to know him. But the truth is he refuses to stay hidden. I mean, he will always meet you where you are and reveal himself to you because he desires for you to know him and his love for you. So, why can't we see or understand Him at times? Well, that's really on us. That's, the problem is, is actually with us. That sometimes we can't see Him or we can't see Him clearly because of our sin, because of our shame, because of our pride. And if you remember last week, we talked about that. You can check that message out if you haven't, and it's a great message. But thankfully, as we also said last week, if we would allow Him God is healing our blindness. God is healing our deafness. God is healing our sin, our shame, and our pride. Because He wants us to see Him, hear Him, and encounter Him in a fresh new way every time. And that's why He's always revealing. He's always loving. He's always saving. He's always blessing. God is a loving Father who longs to reveal himself to you. So open your eyes. Open your eyes to who he truly is and what he's doing in your life. Open your ears. Open your heart. Listen to him. He is speaking to you and revealing his love for you every single day. Amen. Amen. Now at this point, the story takes a shocking turn or a shocking twist, all right? And to continue this message, Brother Bo Sanchez. Hi, God bless you. I am so happy that we're here together again at the Feast of the Lord. If there's one prayer I have in my heart for you and your family, it's this, 
that God is visiting you and His Word is blessing your family. And my prayer is that this coming week, you will experience the presence and the provision of God. I'm praying that your eyes will see that God is there every single day of your life. Amen. All right. We need to continue this crazy story because Matthew, the gospel writer, he does something very unexpected. After showing Peter's wisdom, he shows Peter's foolishness. I mean, he does not even give Peter, you know, six minutes to bask in the spotlight. Oh, Peter, you're great. What did you say? Jesus is the Messiah. And all the apostles saying, yay, that's wonderful. Wow, you're wise, Peter. No such thing. After one sentence, Matthew, the gospel writer, cuts him up to pieces. <laughs> he showed what an idiot he, Peter, was. And I am not exaggerating. You want to read? Here we go. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. Listen, 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 Matthew says. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap for, to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. What just happened? You know, there was only one time in, in, that Jesus called another human being Satan. <laughs> and he just happened to be our first pope, okay? <laughs> Before I give you the main message of this story, may I give you a little pastoral lesson. I, just, I, I found it and I, I want to just share that with you. You see, you and I fight temptations daily. Raise your hand if you do. You do fight temptations. Okay. When you're fighting temptations, can you learn from Jesus? Because you know what Jesus did? He, he, watch what Jesus did. And that's what we need to do. Don't argue. Don't debate. Or, or, or you lose. Jesus said, go away, Satan. I'm not talking to you. That's exactly what we need to do. You know, you need to get rid of temptation. Now, as quickly as you can. You know, when I watch a, an action movie, I see a certain formula being played. You probably see that as well. In the climax of the movie, at the very end, what will the hero do? The hero will throw away his gun and then he will have a slugfest, a mano a mano, you know, 23 minutes long. It's a, it's a long drawn out fight scene. And you know, he gets punched and he almost dies and he almost falls into the ravine. But then at the very end of the movie, he's able to overcome. Great, exciting, and I understand why the directors and the scriptwriters they like that 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 part of the movie at the end, you know, where they make it long. But you know what? It's a horrible strategy for fighting temptations, <laughs> dear friend. Um, if you are being tempted right now, end it quickly right now. Get a nuclear-powered bazooka. You know, D don't go fight with your fist. No, you just from afar, just boom. You know, shoot the temptation down. <laughs> okay, I need to go back to the story. Peter knew that Jesus was the Mashiach, the anointed one, the new king, the new priest. Hooray! But did he knew? Did he actually understand what it all meant? You see, no. Peter was a product of his culture. So, his expectations for the Messiah was exactly the same as everyone else. A political leader who would drive out the Romans and reestablish the nation of Israel as a world superpower again. And to be fair, Peter was not wrong. His definition of the Mashiach was spot on. Based on other Jewish literature, even in the Old Testament, the past Mashiachs were actually violent. Yes! The past messiahs, they, they picked up a sword, they led armies, they cut the throats of their enemies. Um, you want to you wanna check 
um, the book of Judges in the Bible, the book of Maccabees in the Bible. Every other Mashiach sheds the blood of his enemies to win. But the Mashiach of Jesus, his idea of a Messiah, will do the very opposite. He will shed his own blood so that others will win. Matthew wanted us to see. The reason why Matthew was writing Peter in this way is because he wanted us to see ourselves in Peter. Peter got the title of Jesus right, but he didn't get his heart. Like we know who Jesus is. You know who Jesus is. We call him Savior, Healer, Blesser, Provider, Shepherd, Miracle Worker. We love that. Whoa, yes. But here's a million dollar question I want to ask you. Did Jesus come into this world to follow us around, answer our prayers, see what we need, give us the miracles that we need? Because that, that's what a lot of people think Jesus is. I'm going to tell you now that if Jesus uh, is like that, then he is no different than that perennially waving uh, golden cat, you know, for luck. <laughs> uh, you, you've seen those things? Okay. Um, a lot of people think of Jesus as that, you know, for me, to heal me, to provide for me, to bless me, to answer my prayer. This is, this is what, this is, I think, God, God basically is asking us, wait a minute, um, who are you following? Are you following Jesus or are you fit following your version of Jesus? The, the story ends in a bang and let's read it. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross. I'll read that line again. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. When we hear today, modern people, when we hear the word, take up your cross, you know what we think of? We think of, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take, up my cross. My cross is my mother-in-law. My cross is my horrible boss. My cross is my arthritis. My cross is my pimples. You know, that's what we think of cross. But to ancient Jews, when they hear the words, take up your cross, they only think of one thing. Whoever is taking up that cross is going to be dead in a few hours or in 24 hours or in 48 hours. He's going to die. His dead body will be thrown to the dogs outside Jerusalem because at that time when Jesus said, take up your cross, Frequently, they would see, you know, in the streets of Jerusalem, a guy carrying his cross with a phalanx of Roman soldiers behind him, whipping him. And then, yes, they know that that guy's going to die. So what was Jesus doing? When Jesus said, take up your cross, he was saying, come and die. In fact, can I say this? For a lot of people, Jesus' invitation to them is, come, come and follow me and I will solve all your problems. Come and follow me and I will answer all your prayers. Come and follow me and you will live a comfortable life. Um, that's not the Jesus that is in the Bible. The Jesus in Scripture is, come and die. Die to yourself. Come and die. Follow me and be a blessing to others, and be a light to others, and, and, and live your life for others, and, and, and that's, that's the invitation. And I want to pray with you. I want to come before the Lord. Are you ready? Here we go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Just say this after me. Jesus, I, I, I may get the titles right, Lord. I, I kind of like know who you are. I studied you. I learned a little bit. I, I prayed, and, but but. I really want to get your heart. And, and like Peter, I, I may think that I know you, but I want to know you more because I want to follow you every single day of my life. You, you, do, you, you know, Lord God, I, I just, I know that you are my greatest blessing. And even as, even as I ask for blessings, you, you want me. You want me to see you as my greatest blessing and you want me to follow you and to live my life for you and to receive your blessings. Yes, but only so that I can share 
and give and love and care and serve. And so here I am. Change me. Transform me. I am yours. And I will follow you. Amen and amen. Thank you very much, Brother Bo, for that message. Thank you as well for those of you who faithfully give generously to our feast. And we're just grateful that you have also decided to make this your home, make this your family, and help sustain this ministry to bless more people. And so these are the different ways that you can give online and in advance. Again, thank you so much for your faithful generosity. And lastly, thank you everyone for being part of our feast today. Follow Jesus, not your version of Jesus, but who Jesus really is mentioned in scripture and as the spirit reveals to you. Follow him every day and have a great week ahead. God bless you.